Yay! Right, so, final session before wine o'clock. And the performance. <laughs> Where dance and science meet. That's going to be cracking, actually. Um, shall I announce that before this or at the end? Okay. Um, right, so this is the closing plenary with our keynote speakers and Fadus, one of our amazing students. So here to offer another valuable perspective um, on the conversation. So um, take it away. Who wants to begin? What are your perspectives on the day? What are the big sort of takeaways? Brian. Oh, good. I, I, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to do some talking to this group. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been struck this week uh, by how many of the themes um, that I deal with at home come up here. Uh, people want to try new things, but they tend to worry about the same things I see in Canada. Uh, people are worried about running afoul of uh, privacy laws, and I had never heard of anything where there was a possibility of a senior administrator uh, potentially looking at jail time. Yeah. <laughs> Although I have to admit, my head was thinking, if I could get <laughs> provost <laughs> in prison. But can, you, can you not imagine how much work would get done if we were locked in a prison cell? Yeah. <laughs> now that's a retreat. <laughs> That's an edgy, <laughs> edgy event idea, hashtag. Um, also around IP, of course, that came up. And the theme, too, that often came up was, I mean, uh, just kind of questions of precarity uh, and people wondering. A lot of people seem to kind of edge up to me and say, you know, I would like to try this thing. And, but I'm a little worried that if I extend out, I'm not only not only going to be supported, I might even get in trouble for it. Um, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting what any of those people told me, but I, I, know, I, I did hear it. Um, the thing that also came through, though, being in most of these meetings with Daniel and with Sean Hides and Jonathan, was the sense, and, and I, I, I just will say it in case any of you don't deal with the DMLL, is they were like, this is why we're here. <laughs> we're here to take your ideas and give you a framework and keep you from stepping on, you know, on, on, in, on the landmines and to kind of direct you along and, and give you some semblance of collective action and that it's not you alone. And, and definitely something I've learned, uh, it's a lot easier to take a risk if you're part of a group taking the same risk. Yeah. Um, and I heard nothing but willingness and I've checked in repeatedly with the DMLL people. Am I out of line when I say this? And they go, no. So I guess that's my takeaway. Hi everyone, I'm Fadus. Um, I really, really enjoyed this day today. Um, I particularly enjoyed the talks on the game changers and trying to um, change the game, I guess. <laughs> um, and a lot of these things are really, really exciting and they do make us feel hopeful as students as well. But the only problem is sometimes the idea is there but nothing really gets implemented. So I hope that all the lecturers here are really like trying to be open-minded and really, really go in to make some more effort as well in to do those type of things. And then all of us will be willing to come to lecturers and, you know, um, speak to them and actually enjoy the lecture. So, yeah, I feel like these ideas are here and everyone sees it and is really excited. But then I hope that once you go away, you don't just, you know, oh, I'm going back to my wife and my kids and <laughs> they can just learn from the book. So, As a, as a student that... How can you help us do that? Um, I can help you guys out by telling you <laughs> to do it. <laughs> um, I think with us as well, like, although as students as well, we do want all these new innovative ways, but sometimes people are not really comfortable to get out of their comfort zones. So I think by maybe getting students to do more fun things, so not just go to a lecture, that's it, go to a seminar, sit in a group. They need to actually make this a thing where we have different things to do, maybe every other week. So we have a thing to look forward to, and we're not just in the lecturers. But can you contribute to that? Can yeah, we us? can. Um, by coming to class and actually being active. Um, and um, 
influencing everyone else as well to do it because no one else really knows about this area half the time. Like no one knows what's going to think, oh, it's just a green grass area, but actually there's so much happening. So I guess other students do have to also go ahead and tell other students, but that always depends on whether they're passionate when they are that's when everything will go right. So just find the right students and then they'll influence everyone else. And then the lecturers also really need to work hard and listen to us half the time, at least. <laughs> so. Yeah, can the students create things to do every other week that were creating games? Yes, we could. Then you were doing it yourself and you could, you could invite the lecturers mm -hmm. to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't then putting the onus back on the lecturers. No. Like if the students are all excited about this stuff, then why don't the students get together and start creating some games that can then teach the lecturers something? Absolutely. There might be some lecturers that are uncomfortable with this technology, mm. that aren't really familiar with this technology. Scares so are silly students sometimes. Take, take ownership of it and then start creating these things, and there can be an exchange of learning. Which that would be really good, but I think also the other problem is when you've got the students who are thinking, oh, this class is so boring, I wish we were something else. But then sometimes some of the lecturers are not really like approachable, or you don't feel comfortable, and plus I don't feel like most of the lecturers, personally for me, because that's the reason marketing, are too approachable. Like, they're not your friend. They are still your lecturer, but they, if they had like a better general relationship with their with their students it would be better i think or at least knew our names and we because we know their names they don't know our names <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, sorry i know you're meant to be talking but just quickly i think there's a kind of back and forth there the students say look would you get involved would you give us new options and then the teachers come back and say well would you get more involved and you tell us what to do but we're the adults we should be the ones leading by example and I think that's important. So if they, you want to get them to do it, you have to do it too. So I think that's why we get these places together, to try and inspire the teachers to try new things. The students will be more on board then, and they will be more open to try things too. And I think if they're not the ones starting that conversation, then we must do that. Alex, I want to add to that, though. I think it's really important. We need to trust the students. Because when I work with students, and I trust you guys, and I say, over to you, turn it around, Let's do some stuff. Some absolutely magical things happen. Things level up, and we both learn from each other. And I think that's the key. And I think sometimes we get too much into, ah, but if you did this, or if you did that, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's that's where it goes wrong. Get it together, and it, it really starts to get interesting. So, I absolutely agree <laughs> with that. Um, I just wanted to make the point that we can keep pointing to each other as much as we like, but. As sort of what Alex says, we need to kind of put, make that first step. When we get excited about teaching, people around us then get really excited about learning, and then they get inspired to then start taking control of their own learning environments, environments themselves. I mean, that's exactly why I'm here, because that is exactly what happened to me. And I've taken that and I'm applying that with what I do with other people and other students, and I'm looking at the people that I, who work with me and they are suddenly like super inspired and they're saying I really want to do this I have all of the oh my god I'm really passionate about this and that it's just a, but we don't have we we can't engage that with that conversation unless we have that conversation in the first place it needs to be more of a, a, a conversation a, you know a dialogue not just us telling you you know if you want this you should go do it it's not it's not the case I don't think but. Um, I'm a graphic design student second year and as someone who would class themselves as engaged it gets quite tiring people constantly battering with you with that statement like you should be doing it yourself like you come to higher education for some influence like inspiration and when the tutors do come in to give that not 100% of the people in the room are going to be engaged people are going to leave people go for lunch and don't come back but that like people that are engaged shouldn't suffer because of that like brush that all students can be tarred with about well if you turn up then maybe we'll be inspiring so I think you've got to just aim at the people that are interested and that others will follow or fail and that's up to them like that's what I thought <laughs> that's what I thought higher education was and if you aren't good enough to be here you sh shouldn't be <laughs> Don't hear me though. Anyway. Thanks. <laughs> well, my takeaway. <laughs> Moving on. Um, I just wanted to say this is an amazing space, and everyone that works at Coventry 
you are streets ahead of lots of other people with having permission to have grass on your steps. That is just awesome. Um, this little space is good. I didn't think you'd get this many people in here. It just is quite surprising. It's like a TARDIS. It's lovely. Um, but having this permission to, to explore and to change is very, very important. Um, lots of other universities were, were looking, because I periscoped it this morning. So it, it's important to look and see what other things are happening. One big thing, I think, from everybody's conversations all day has been the change of control. So the locus of control is no longer with the institution, really. Um, it's with all of us so we are the people and I think that the people have a responsibility to educate and learn and we're using data using the systems and the tools that are outside the control of an institution is still an education and it's very very valuable so no pressure change the world yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things I realized the takeaway for me is there might be some more room for my therapy to grow <laughs> in relationship between faculty and students like I think there's like I could maybe mediate some of that <laughs> so that's thank you for that <laughs> I'm with you on that you know I have to echo I was with Brian I trailed Brian through the last two and a half days and I was struck by the way in which folks reacted to certain possibilities versus others but what always strikes me when I go to a place is I think the what's happening and there's a lot of places that has pockets of this happening in different places and what i'm fascinated by at coventry and which i felt was happening to some degree at mary washington is there was a hub for it you've built a hub for it people come here they are connecting the people coming here and being engaged just today for me is always enlightening about um a culture trying to struggle with this and it is a struggle and there shouldn't be clean answers and I don't think anyone today came away with, okay, this is how we need to go forward. That's, that's something Coventry has to figure out, students and faculty alike, as well as staff. So that's cool. It's cool to see you're in this position and you've gotten actually some funding, right, to do it. Um, so for me, that's always a great takeaway that you're in a position to actually lead on this as an institution. That's a great position to be in. What can I say? Everyone else has already said it. So I, I want to pick up on what Becky just said about failing and that it, it's something that's bugged me for a long time, that we don't let our students fail, we don't allow them a space to fail. And the same with our staff. You know, you can't experiment because what if it goes wrong and your students aren't happy and you get a bad MEQ or a, a module evaluation and then you're... you're your league table result goes down or, you know, it might be bad. Yeah. We need a space where we can fail, all of us. And that is staff and students. And I think that the lab has offered that, that we've offered a safe space, if you like, where we'll take the blame. I sometimes get into trouble for saying that. <laughs> I'm not looking sideways. But, you know, we, we should be the safe space where people can come and try stuff out and it doesn't matter if it fails. Because we try stuff out, and it does, not everything we've done in the lab has worked. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, not looking that way at all. But, you know, we've tried loads of stuff, and some of our stuff hasn't worked, and some of it has taken off to an extent that we didn't expect. And, and it's been great. So everybody should have that opportunity, not just those of us who work in the lab. Anyone in the university, anyone outside the university wants to come work with us, come work with us, come try stuff. That's what we do in this great space, which we're happy to share. <laughs> yeah. You've just said that, Jackie, and actually I've just had a conversation with the Deputy Dean of Engineering Environment and Computing, who is going to create a space to allow academics to fail, so that they can, because <laughs> he was so impressed with today and what went on, he's, he's going to create this space and he's going to allow academics that want to innovate to not be measured on the student satisfaction for that iteration or whatever. Uh, to try and encourage more innovation as he moves to trying to flip the entire faculty. Can we know those spaces where students are allowed to fail, where, you know, because for students, you know, we've talked about badges, but they've also got their degree results, that kind of thing. So if students, if staff should be allowed to fail out of the MEQs, surely students also need to be able to do some things that don't impact on their degree results. Yeah. Have I just got myself in trouble as well now? No. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're up there, you and me. We're, well, they just called <laughs> elements at one point. I think it's something that um, I'm quite interested in 
and it's good that we have you guys here to tell us more about the student perspective is that you know possibly most people in this room are here because we are passionate about doing things better and doing things differently and providing our students with exciting engaging experiences because basically we get much more out of it that way too but how about students who think why are they mucking around talking about innovation all the time? I just want to get my degree and get a job. You know, what are your perspectives on that? Because sometimes I feel as if the students, or lots of students are way more conservative than lots of us are. And so that's a bit of a, an issue. I feel like with Coventry University as well, um, it's a modern university. People know what they're going to get when they come here. Like, come on, we have a Snapchat filter, guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we have um, the buildings always changing. Like, it's, it's, it's becoming more exciting and more modern, modern definitely. So I feel like if you're going to come to Coventry University, you should already know this isn't just any old traditional building. It's not been here for years and years. Like, we are modern. So I feel like if you come here, you should definitely know that you're not going to just go to class or you shouldn't just go to class and go to lectures and that's it. You should be able to do more because again, we have Advantage Plus, we have so many opportunities to go abroad and not a lot of unis have that. So when you come here, you should know that you are going to do much more than just your degree. So I feel like when you make a decision, you already have got yourself into it. So you can't really say actually I just want my degree and go because you're just wasting your own time and your own money really. I, I mean I just want to make a point building on that is Brian and I when we came out of our session yesterday or Monday came out to a full lab like this place was like a beehive people were going to town they were working they were into it and I was like you know that's that's a good thing. Like, I mean, there's that too. And they brought it and Brian got a picture of it and we were talking about it. And I mean, that I love the way you just said, like, it's modern and we're here and it's not a traditional building. It's like, yeah, kick ass. <laughs> like, yeah, like you're, you're going to make this what it is. And I think that's in a spirit that that's cool. And I think if you your teach a room full of students like that, then you do learn from them. And it is a, it is a kind of a journey and a discovery. So that's cool. It seems like it's on both sides. The faculty are here to learn, but from what I saw of the students in my short time here, it's a two-way street. <laughs> okay, another question then, just for everybody really. Um, tools like Splot and, or platforms rather, like Splot and Sandstorm, is everybody clear about what these platforms are for, what they're about? Right, because I think that's something that is really kind of useful for us to know, and I'm sure you can sort of sum it up pretty quickly now, but um, I'm getting pointed over in your direction, Brian. Can you just tell us a bit about Sandstorm and Splot? Because we do have the inst we do have them here. We will support them with you if you want to explore, and it's a really good way for people to start using the tools. Before I do, could I ask the person that said they know a little bit what you think you know? Because, I mean, I, I feel like I've been talking about it a lot, so I'm obviously... Um, well, just from today, I, I, um, I really like the idea of Splot as a way into just sharing a way of writing and getting into blogging or getting into ways of, yeah, sharing my research practice. I thought I, I love the ease of it and the simplicity of it, so I, I want it, yeah, I want it. And with um, Sandstorm, I saw that as a series of apps again, I like the idea that it's institutionally hosted and we've got more control over the data. I think that was great. So uh, I know that much, and, and I know I want to know more. And I'm part of the DMLL, so I know we've got them, so that's great. Uh, <laughs> um, does anyone have anything to build on that before I try to... Um, I mean, the idea of this spot really just came out of... I will hand back to you. Like, the, the idea of this spot really came just as I just... I'll try to say what I said this morning, but maybe a little more directly. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I've been passionate about trying to get people on the open web for a long time because for me, it's been intensely meaningful and powerful. It's got how I've gotten to know... That's why I'm here. Not just because, well, break someone in because of this, but, I mean, it's like how I know people here when I arrive. Uh, and I've been learning from people here for years. 
Um, and it's everywhere I go, it's like that. And it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that I just can't believe that not everyone's benefiting from it. <laughs> so that's what, 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 what gets me excited. And at my university, Thompson Rivers University, when I, I was thinking about moving there, I was, well, let's go see what they're, what they're up to. And all I could find was their university official website and stuff put up by marketing departments. And I was like, well, is this just a garbage school? Of course, when I went there, there's amazing things happening all over the place. And for whatever reason, there really wasn't a culture of sharing. Now, so after all these, you know, I can say that, but I, again, I've done hundreds, if not thousands, of intro to blogging workshops. And it took about nine or 900 or so, and I started to go, okay, people are just, there's just too much upfront effort to doing it. And I remember, and then the issue with privacy came up. And, and my privacy officer at my institution, um, when, um, when I have a request at my institution, boy, I hope this is, is this being streamed? I, it, people could be awake, and, but no one's watching, no one cares. Um, <laughs> what am I thinking? Um, it has gotten to the point, anytime I have an encounter with a privacy officer, I write it up and then I give it to someone else and ask them to submit it, because they see me coming in, they're just... So I just didn't want to deal with that anymore. And so I was just kind of venting to my friend Alan Levine, who was working with us on a research fellowship. I was just like, I, you know, I don't care. You know, like, I do care. I want people to know how to set up a domain of their own and control their data and do stuff. But you know, that's why people go to the LMS, is because they see that and they see all these barriers. I'm just sick of it. I'm just sick of dealing with that issue. And, they, and, and, and then Alan said, actually, um, uh, Jim had mentioned Tom Woodward earlier. He goes, uh, Tom Woodward has this site about greenwashing, and students submit examples of greenwashing through a web form, and it goes to the site. And he says, and they don't have to log in. And I was like, well, let's do that. <laughs> and we ended up using a different approach than Alan did, but it really is just like the writing tool is designed to be the simplest possible way to get clean, nicely formatted, attractive, mobile-friendly, you know, web standards friendly writing on the web. And that's all it does. And sometimes people, can we make a group function? No, <laughs> no. Can we make it public for this and private for that? No. <laughs> um, and then we created one for images, uh, same thing. Uh, very simple web form to input images, no logins or accounts required. We don't collect any data. There's no means for collecting data. So the learning analytics people go, can you? Can we set up a learning analytics? No, <laughs> it, you can't. And um, we have a friend named Darcy Norman. He says, every technology becomes more like an NLMS the more you use it in technology. And it kind of does happen with WordPress proper. People start putting groups and this and that and analytics and stuff. And he goes, it's going to happen to your splots too. And he goes, no, it won't. <laughs> because the minute you start to make it more like an NLMS, it ceases to be a splot. So, um, and we have one for sound, and we've got a couple other tools that nobody seems to want to use. Um, I actually really hope people will start making spots, and actually Pat Lockley, who was here earlier, he says he's got some ideas. Uh, Tony Hurst says he has some ideas, so that's been very fruitful. That don't necessarily even involve WordPress. The idea is just pick one kind of thing you would like to do as an activity. Could be a learning activity, could just be a publishing activity or a collaboration activity, and just do that one thing. Don't worry about anything else. Don't worry, and, and, and make it as simple as you can make it, and don't take, collect anyone's data. So that's, that's the spot. Sandstorm is a little more complicated, and it's newer to me, and it's like this new power, <laughs> and I, I kind of don't quite know what to do with it. I just know that it's easier than ever to install an application, a wide range of applications, to do all sorts of things, and a lot of those apps I have never used, so I can't even assess a lot of them. I know that it now allows me to share a ready, like I can, if I, if I, you know, when you install that blank WordPress site and then you build it all out, I can now share that fully rendered, ready to run. And we couldn't do that before. And I'm told the security of it means that every component is completely independent and that if one piece breaks, it doesn't affect the others, which has been the kind of one of those things that IT always says to me why I can't do things. So that one, though, we still have, and actually I wish if I'm talking, you know, if I get to talk to more of you either online or in other venues or whatever, I'm, the thing I'm trying to figure out is how do we roll this out to people beyond ed techs? So, I mean, 
like do maybe do we give people that panel or do we think let's create like maybe a spot using one of these apps like create a, an etherpad collaborative writing with prompts built in ready to run and there here's your here's a writing exercise and like have like a, just a really simple page where you say do you want this click do you want a dropbox clone that's not illegal to use click so thinking about you know and then what does that do for the job of the ed tech? Like if we're not supporting a big system and trying to get everyone to train in, within the VLE, like we'd start thinking about little ready to run services and doing it, like why just within a group? Do it worldwide. Now how do we evaluate? What's a good one? You know, I've generated hundreds of these grains. 10 of them are maybe good. The other 90 are just me messing around. So I don't know that, I hope I didn't go too long winded, but I, Sandstorm is something I'm still thinking through, and, and thankfully there's other people doing it. Thank you. Uh, one of the main problems of a virtual learning environment is that interactions, they are constrained by the curriculum. So you interact within a module, and then when the module is over, it's gone. So one of the other instruments I, that I'm quite keen on exploring is, uh, is the uh, CUNY uh, academic commons model. So I would like to know more about your thoughts. And because when I talk to this, to some people they say, well, but do we really need another platform? And I think, I think yes, because you can do, probably you can go to Facebook and do many of these interactions. Uh, but at the same time, we need to problematize the idea of going and relying on so many platforms uh, that belong to commercial companies. Um, I would like to know more about uh, your thoughts on this? Well, especially because because you were involved in the <laughs> in the idea of that. I, I like having too much. <laughs> so if you want to give me a I know, I know. <laughs> hey, Mr. Are you done over there? Can I talk now? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, CUNY Academic Commons, for those of you who may not know, is. I <laughs> But I'll hold it. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I don't really want to answer this question. That's how I'm doing this. Okay. Uh, no, I'm kidding. CUNY Academic Commons is something developed by the City University of New York to provide a community around a WordPress site, basically using a plugin or a series of plugins called BuddyGraph. What you're referring to that might be of interest is this creates a community of people like a social network that's not Facebook or other and provides a space for something like the DMLL or Coventry to share and build out those options. So kind of a, a hub. What people have been using this for, and which is interesting, and I can point to the Modern Language Association of the US, the MLA, for any of you who are familiar with that organization, are using that to kind of provide an alternative to something like academia.edu. And that's something that I even know faculty at this school have had problems with um, because um, not only is it a little staticky, as you heard, but also <laughs> it provides um, the space where you're putting all of your academic work into a system that you're not sure what they're doing with your data, how long it will be there, questions we've talked about for the last day. So the CUNY Academic Commons developed by folks like Matt Gold, Boone Gorgas, and many other at City University of New York is a really, it's a compelling program, it's an open source application, it's being funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, and they're doing really a remarkable work. And what do you think is the key, because Corlea is working, so so many people are in this platform and then are interacting beyond setting the technical platform, what do you think is the key for, for this, uh, what do you think is the key for the success of uh, CUNY Academic Commons? It's the ability to get people to support and promote community. Yeah. So the folks who you have here at the DMLL would have to do the hard work of building and supporting community by highlighting the great work happening in it, by supporting faculty to use it, by supporting students to get involved. Um, all the work we talked about, that negotiation we were all talking about between faculty and students, it would be a broader negotiation as a community to use this platform to highlight the great work. Brian referred to it when he looked at TRU. A good, just a very simple exercise would be go out and search Coventry and maybe academic work or whatever you want to put in there and see what you find. 
And then ask yourself, can you build something that when people do that search, they're going to find the best work that this community wants to highlight? Because I think that's what we did at the University of Mary Washington for the last decade. And it worked wonders. Because our students know their work would get out there. Our faculty did. And it started to build a culture around publishing and around open web publishing. And that's, it's a very simple, we talked about it at the very beginning of this talk, it's a very simple concept. We're not selling snake oil here. We're not selling anything overly complex. In fact, it was figured out by uh, a British guy in 1989, 1990, right? <laughs> He's a sir now. And it's not a fad. OK, so we've got six minutes left. Six people on the panel. So can I just finish off with a question for East? And basically. Just to, <laughs> just to finish off today, it'd be really good if each of you could just sum up um, your peak experience in learning in less than one minute. <laughs> Something that's happened to you that's made you think, my God, this has changed my life. My God, I love learning. So who wants to go first? Um, uh, only because I finished my master's fairly recently, those two or three years ago, with um, Edinburgh, all online again. And my moment, my aha moment was when we covered what digital literacies were, uh, because my whole 10 years of working at the university before that, um, I was just told uh, to go and talk to academics about using technology to teach with, get them to do it. But there's no basis, there's no foundation for anything. So when we were covering digital literacy, that was like, oh my God, this is what it's all about. This is the, I get this done right, and then we all the other things will slot into place. So that was my thing. Who wants to go? Which way? Okay. Probably the coolest moment for me with learning had to do with, I was in Los Angeles at UCLA as an undergraduate, and my girlfriend was a, at the time, was a student in film. And I didn't, wasn't a film student, I was an English student. And she's like, I'm going to class now. So I went with her. She said, you can come with me. We went into a big theater and saw a 35 millimeter version of John Carpenter's Halloween. And that was class. And then the professor came and talked about it, like how the music was working and questions of gender and how the horror in the 80s was built. I was like, holy shit. You can make, like, this is higher ed? You can talk about John Carpenter? And like talk about all these important cultural moments and I was blown away. It changed my life, right? That you could sit and watch a movie and that was education in a context like that. No pressure, okay. The, there is something that, there are two things that stick with me in my mind, but the, one of them was, um, I got taught by Richard Dawkins before he became very famous and anybody knew who he was and um, he used reggae music in his lecture. And that I don't remember much about what he was teaching us because it was zoology. And why I was there, I'm not quite sure. But he was a really engaging, I think it was genetics, not zoology. But the reggae music, I can still hear it. So I can't remember what he was teaching us, but I can remember that song. Did you sing it? No. To be completely honest, Nothing has given me a wow moment so far, but I still have a year left, so maybe next year. <laughs> um, I, I, I kind of was just floored by that question because most of the ones that come immediately to mind, and I don't think I can name any of them because I'm sure there's something even better than whatever I could come up with, it usually involve getting to know somebody through networks and then having some sort of personal experience with them. Um, one that popped into my mind, it was just because I was talking to Jonathan about it, in 2012 I find myself on a boat playing the drums with a bunch of musicians who were like other speakers at the conference and were making up songs on the fly, taking requests from the audience and people are dancing, like 60 people dancing and you know, and, and we never rehearsed as we sounded like, but you know, it actually came out alright and that was, there's a lot of those, like dozens are just flooding my head, but, so I'll pick a techie one though. Um, I think is, I mean, it doesn't really matter who's first, but I started one of the earliest like institutional wikis, and the very first one we started was using software called UseMod, which was very, very much like the very, very first wiki that Ward Cunningham developed. Uh, 
right, really early days. And at the time, you couldn't put a password on it. And you could have a username, but it didn't really affect what you did. And you could totally, like, there was, it was just completely flat, completely anarchic. And it just opened up. I, I, you know, it was one of those things we just did it. If we'd asked for permission, we never would have been allowed to. And it immediately took off. And immediately, people started doing things like creating like collaborative novels without knowing who it was. And I remember one person wrote this essay, and I still have it quoted somewhere on my blog. It was like, I like this wiki because my identity is completely withdrawn from it. You don't know what I'm writing. You don't know when somebody else is writing with me. And paper can't solidify against me. You know, and I'm reading things like this every day. And at one point, like there were, and there were like anarchist groups, collectives in Europe were using it to organize and stuff. And I don't know as much as the anarchists were organized. And I would like look at their, their, their profiles and they were just lunatics. But it was just, it was really cool. And then at one point, a lot of the users, because easily 80% of the users had nothing to do with the University of British Columbia. Like it was just completely, just people found a space, it was a green space, and they colonized it. And um, I remember at one point, there was like this rebellion amongst the community that this wiki was too UBC centric. And I said, I, I had to like respond, I said, well, I, I hear what you're saying, <laughs> but it is the UBC wiki. <laughs> and I just loved that I was engaged in that dialogue. And there was some of the power dynamics of the whole thing. It was just thrilling and everything. At one point, though, the spammers started to move in. And I was thinking, oh, I can't, I'm going to have to start to lock this thing down. I have to start looking into you know, sh shutting down editing because the spamming was getting out of control. And some person wrote a bot that came in and clean, like wrote a custom bot just for my wiki to clean the wiki out automatically. And I never found out who that person was. I tried to. I said, if you tell me who you are, I will send you money. And they refused to tell me. Those, so that, those were just fun days. And I, I said, I'm still chasing that buzz in one form or another. 